A very good evening, a very good afternoon, a very good morning if you're watching somewhere where it is currently morning or a very good night if you're Hong Kong and you're Luke who watches quite often from Hong Kong and it's almost tomorrow wherever you are. Good evening, good, very warm welcome and thank you for joining. Dan really likes wine presented by Pick and Pay and it starts on a rather sad note. It's going to get very much more upbeat because we've got two cracking wine people to talk to in just a moment but we start with a little bit of sadness because a really good friend of mine had some bad news today. Pete Goffwood, the chef who's joined us in this space before. We've done a lot of television work before. Uh, he's the guy who pretty much taught me to cook along with my housemate Camilla. They were the two who pointed me in the right direction well, 20 odd years ago and Pete about nine months ago kicked off a brand new really exciting project at the Grand Roche in Pal called Viande, a terrific restaurant that showcased the flair that Pete has with food. He's a, a real natural when it comes to a sense of theatre, both with his food and just being himself. And the combination was terrific. And sadly, as a result of lockdown and the impact that it's had on the food and wine industry, the restaurant has had to close its doors. And Pete not a tear, just a little bit upset for him, really. Just uh, had to say goodbye. It's his team, everybody he works with. Uh, I know Pete will bounce back. I'm hoping his team will all find spaces to move into soon. But it's uh, one of many restaurants that sadly closed their doors in what has been an incredibly tough time. So if you are watching, if you do have the wherewithal, I know times are tough, but if you are able to get out and spend a little money at one of our South African restaurants, Gee, do they need it at the moment. And the advantage, of course, of going to South African restaurants, if you're watching this here in South Africa, is that you can get loads and loads of South African wine. And South African wine, as we tell you on a weekly basis and more, is absolutely fabulous. And today we get two guys who will reaffirm that very emphatically indeed. A little later on in the show, we talk to somebody whose wines you might know, just not under their current name. I've been drinking Edgebaston wines for many, 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 many years. What you might not know is that Edgebaston is run by one of the 817 Finlaysons who operate in the greater wine space here in South Africa. And it is David Finlayson who has made his wines now the David Finlayson's wines, wines thereof. And we'll be tasting a couple of those, talk about why they've changed the name and look at what is a really exciting time for David and his team. But we start off with a visit to Franschuk and a part of South Africa that is doing its best to lay claim to the title of home of South African bubbles. Now, there are a couple of people in Robertson who might take issue with that. And I think it's a fabulous battle because both territories give us really, really good examples of Cup Classique. The one we have today is made by someone who has put his stamp on a couple of different Bubbles brands, but we find him now in the space at Colmont. So let's say a very good evening, Paul Herber. Paul, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Now, Dan really likes wine. Hey, Dan. Yeah, it's like it. Thanks for the opportunity to chat about Bubbles, Cup Classique, and yeah, I'd share a glass on a Thursday afternoon. Uh, first of all, I have to apologize because I do feel rather bad. I was in Franschuk last week. Uh, I started off at your old haunt where I, I drank your bubbles just under a, a different label. We had some Lelude. Uh, and then I was staying just down the road with Sherrod Holden and his a beautiful manor house. Uh, and then the world turned upside down and the worst weather in the history of South Africa hit. And uh, instead of stopping in to say hello at Colmont, we just dashed back to Cape Town to see ref huge back at Element House. I'm sorry I didn't come to see you. I will come and see you soon. But in the interim, I can drink some of your cup, Tussie, which I'm really excited about. And it's a, a, a space that you've become synonymous with. You only have to look at your social media handles to see that your alchemy bubbles are all over the place because that's what you're so good at. How did you go from somebody who I'm sure just had an interest in wine into making wine into discovering that effervescence, that Cap Classique, the champagne style was your particular space? Um, that, you know, it's an interesting story. Um, I, I always say it was six months after getting married, but my wife said it was about a month. Um, I managed to convince her one Friday evening to, to let me go and study oenology at Stellenbosch. And uh, um, before I did that, I'd done one harvest just to, to kind of check things out with a, a friend of mine that had played with me in the front row at Stellenbosch. So rugby and bubbles have always been my, my life. And um, I'm a little bit at, at making bubbles than rugby. So yeah, it's, it's been a, a good trip. Studied at Stellenbosch, worked uh, in, in the north of Europe or in, in Europe, and then returned to to make some exciting bubbles in South Africa. 
Tell me about that time in Europe, because so often on this show, when we talk to winemakers, we talk about their journey, there is an international component, and they describe how doing some time in New Zealand, working in Napa, uh, some time in Germany, has had a really big impact, not just on their scientific and technical understanding of making wine, but their appreciation of it, their opinion, uh, getting the romance of wine really under the skin. But what did your time in Europe do for you as a winemaker? Yeah, Dan, I worked in the in the north of Italy and Francia Porta, which is um, is world renowned for its um, traditional style of uh, bottle fermented sparkling wine in uh, in Germany, which makes some really exceptional um, sparkling wines, and then obviously in Champagne in, in the Côte de Blanc, uh, which is is probably one of my greatest loves. But I, I think one of you know, the, from each cellar you you pick up small techniques and you you learn new ideas and your your palate is challenged. But one of the things that was probably deepest to me was this concept of terroir um, and understanding how decisions were made by people whose family had been in the same village for for the last decade, sometimes three, four decades, even longer, and this understanding of, of the balance between the plant ripening and the soil because with, without good base product, without great grapes grown in the right place, um, you, you know, it's pretty impossible to, to make wines that are, are going to show the finesse and elegance that we want. I love the fact you brought up terroir because that speaks to something I mentioned in the introduction, Robertson and Franchuk and the, the friendly, unofficial game of one-upsmanship as to who's got the best bubbles. You're very close friends with Peter Ferreira, who headlines the Robertson range. Uh, you do much the same in Franchuk. If we look specifically at Franchuk, there's yourselves. There's the wine you made at Le Lud. We look uh, up the road, everything they do at Pierre Jordan. They make bubbles at Le Mottes. Bubbles all over Franchuk. So much of it is so good. And what is it specifically about the terroir, about the climate of France that lends itself to this style? So um, we, we lucky at uh, Cormor, um, Jean-Philippe and I have uh, the ability to pick in various regions and have uh, relationships with, 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 with various producers. France has wonderful acidity, but there's a, there's a ripeness and a fullness from the grape here that gives you a texture in the wine, um, that this kind of pearlescence to the bubble eventually. And obviously we pick in, in other areas um, to, to fulfill other needs for the wine. But, um, so we, we don't make 100% French Chouk. It's, uh, for us, it's a, it's a blend from many vineyards together. Um, but to give you an idea, we probably pick about seven different Chardonnay vineyards within French Chouk and probably about four different Pinot Noir vineyards, each bringing its own character, its own uh, feel to the wine. So I think Tawai is, is definitely part of Cap Classico, definitely part of Champagne, and working really carefully with the grapes and, and preserving that intensity in the grape beds, you see the Tawai. Mm which manifests itself in some terrific results. And I can no longer hold myself back, Mr. Herbert. So I want to jump in to the first of those. But I'd also like you to do something for me. Now, I got a lesson from your good friend, Peter Ferreira, uh, a couple of weeks ago on how to perfectly open a bottle of Cap Classique or Champagne if you're uh, stuck with the French alternative. Uh, so uh, uh, watch this. Tell me if I've got it right. This is the Ferreira technique, uh, gently opening... Uh, the top, he gave it some name that I can't remember, but it sounded very technical. Uh, so off comes that. Uh, and then the important part that uh, that he said, once I've unscrewed, I think it's a three and a half turns exactly, or four, 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 probably slightly more than that. Um, but then what he said I had to do was uh, not turn the cork, but turn the bottle and stick my thumb inside. So thumb inside and holding the cork. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so a slightly more energetic finish than I had planned, but generally, how was my technique? Yeah, um, I think up to the about three seconds ago, it was a nine out of ten. So <laughs> we, we can. <laughs> oh dear! All right. Well, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, there's one or two more sessions with uh, Mr. Bubbles Ferreira. Um, you'll you'll get it done. 
<laughs> All right. Well, the important part is it is open, so I can drink it, which is what I want to do. This mm. is the Brute. It's the Brute Reserve. Uh, so there we go. In fact, Ronaldo, our producer, has probably got a slightly better picture of it. There we are. Uh, just, just give us a, a sketch of this, what it is, what makes it up, and, uh, and why it gets that reserve label. So um, there, there's two parts to, to this wine, um, Dan. The, the first part is the Brut Reserve is our, our house blend. So it speaks to how Jean-Philippe and I feel about the house style, freshness, elegance, finesse, um, but we also want a softness in the palate because it's it's the house non-vintage blend. So it's always a blend of, of a number of years. So a nice even balance between Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir bringing the kind of soft suppleness and the, the Chardonnay bringing this kind of lean zippy te texture to the wine, character to the wine. And then we use a reserve component. So that's why it's a brute reserve. And the reserve component keeps... From each year, we keep some of the best wines back. And Jean-Philippe has done this from 2006. So we have a, what's called a perpetual reserve, a reserve that you keep blending um, for the last 14 years of, of some of the best components that we can blend back into the wine. And the idea behind this is to, to create a, a wine that's easily accessible. But also, if you buy it each year, there's this common thread, this common trait to the wine that you think, OK, I can uh, feel the suppleness of the, the Pinot Noir and the, the elegance of the Chardonnay and this, um, you know, this is cool now. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that sense of continuity because you get people who buy the, the French classics, get a bottle of Mout, get a bottle of Verve, they, they know exactly what they're getting because year in, year out, it's being repeated. So you're going for that. It's one thing to say it, though. Is it another to actually do it? How hard is it to create this facsimile year in, year out? Yeah, it's probably the greatest challenge that we do face. Um, you know, a world-renowned author on champagne, Peter Lim, said that one one of the wines that he's always impressed by is the the Krug um, Grand Cuvée, and that you know that's even on a bigger blend than what we're dealing with. But the incredible thing there is that year in year out, the 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 consistent quality is there, and so that's what we strive for. Though. That's what you put as your benchmark, your, your non-vintage, um, kind of ticking those boxes each year. And it's a really a tough challenge. I mean, 2020 was a, a wonderful harvest. We were really happy with the quality that we received. You know, but some years it's not like that. So you, some years you rely a little bit more on the reserve wine, other years on the base component from that year. So, yeah, definitely probably the biggest challenge that we have. What about handing over the baton? You've come from Le Lude where you made splendid wine, really put Le Lude on the map in terms of their Cup Classy. You now get to comment where there is an existing history of wine and you've now got to feed into that and go, right, well, they've made this before. I've now got to try and replicate that. How tough is that job? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a big challenge. It's big shoes to fill. Uh, I mean, Jean-Philippe is an incredible businessman, but he's also an outstanding winemaker in his own right. So definitely big shoes uh, to fill, but we work alongside each other. We share the same vision. And ironically enough, in the, in the biggest story of life, one, when, I was, when I was studying, it was one of the places that I did a base wine blending as a student for the first time ever uh, by invite to someone else that was at the tasting. They invited me to attend the blending. So one of my first blendings ever was actually at Cool Mom. Um, and Jean-Philippe and I have stayed friends and, and this seemed the natural progression to, for us both to take Cool Mom to the next level. Mm, which you are clearly doing. Uh, this is great. There's almost a honeyed finish to this, although it's dry. It's certainly no demi sec. It's lovely and dry and as a, as a brute would be. Uh, we've got a rosé to try as well. Just before we do that, though, uh, you mentioned JP a few times. Uh, explain the Belgian connection. Uh, we know Belgium has some great exports. Tintin, uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, uh, Martina Hingis, uh, Hercule Poirot, and, and now uh, a champagne lover whose home is now in Franschhoek. Yeah, um, so just a short history for Jean-Philippe, lived in the south part of Belgium, was a, a big champagne lover, traveled there often, bought a lot of champagne. And when he emigrated to, to South Africa, he, he set about setting up the, the first cup cellar that was 
just for Cap Classique. No, no other wine was ever going to be made here. Everything has been custom designed for that. And it's, I think, his vivacious love of spawn wine, of, of champagne, of Cap Classique, that has driven him. And, um, and, and as I say, incredible consistency and, and quality each year. So, uh, you know, always in the past, where, where I've ever I've been, um, there's always been a bottle of Kumar in the fridge. So um, I've always enjoyed his wines. And, uh, and I think uh, moving forward, really, really excited about the new projects that we're putting into action and, and what we're about to do. We, uh, we're similar in this house. We often have a bottle of common in the fridge. It doesn't tend to last very long, Paul. It doesn't have a great shelf life in the nickel household. Uh, and when you try the brute, you can understand why. Uh, we have a second here. So this is the Colomite Brut Rosé. Uh, while I attempt to open this with a little less theatrical flourish, uh, tell us about the rosé and what goes into making this so special, Paul. So I think what's slightly different about our approach in the rosé is that we're looking for crisp elegance. So, you know, to quote Peter Ferreira, um, South African Cup Classics must show the, the ripeness from the sun. And I, I believe he's, he's definitely correct on that. But we're looking for an elegance or a persistence on the palate from the Chardonnay. So 75% Pinot Noir, 25% Chardonnay. But we make a little bit of red wine just for the color. And the balance here is we're looking for that kind of rose petal floral character to the rosé, the nice ripeness of the fruit, and then this kind of zippy acidity from the Chardonnay to, to carry the wine. And, and it should be crisp, but, you know, the second sip um, should follow as easily as the first. Oh, I managed to open oh. that without the cork going up my nose, so uh, I'm making a little bit of progress. Hey, you mentioned the colour there, when I look at it, I'm not sure just how well you can spot this uh, on screen, uh, but it said is it, it's a lot darker than a lot of the rosé we get, particularly the current style, be it effervescent or still, uh, a lot of people are going for that more onion skin, that lighter pink, uh, that sort of colour. This is a, it's a lot denser, it looks quite impressive. Uh, a particular reason for that, is it purely cosmetic or does it affect what's on the palette as well? Yeah, so it's, it's for us about how it looks in the glass. We feel that when you put the glass, what you're going to see in the glass and what you taste on the palate, there should be a reflection or a resonance there. So if you have this kind of light, elegant fruit, red character, you should see that in the glass. So it shows much lighter in the glass than you would expect. It shows a nice development um, in the glass. So definitely denser, a little darker. But I think there's a nice persistence to the fruit that's that's good for the wine. All right, let me give it a crack. I've had the brute many times. This is my debut with the Colmant Rosé. There's a lovely little wisp of almost Turkish delightish on the nose. Mmm. Um, oh, that's very tasty, Mr. Herber. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's not... Um, Fire away. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I, I think it's that um, that we try to achieve, this kind of richness from the fruit, and then a drier finish makes the, the wine shine a little bit more elegantly, and slightly, it gives a little kind of frivolous finish to the wine, not too, not too austere. Mm. Uh, speaking of frivolous, Greg Sherwood is watching the show at the moment from London. Just love the Blue Label Colmont, great spot for Paul. Thank you, Mr. Sherwood. Nice to see you. Picture there it is, a uh, holiday home at Harder Pierce Port Dam uh, with his significantly younger wife and uh, checking in from London. Uh, two, two great wines here. I believe, though, that uh, the, uh, the range you have at the moment is about to be supplemented and in particular by something rather special. Tell me about the Absolute, Paul. Yes, yeah, so the, the Absolute is, um, is one of the the projects that Jean-Philippe and I um, like the most. So Chardonnay is a, is a real love of mine. Um, I've worked at a, a small cellar in, in, in Japan and Lemon News Roger for the last 10, 11 years. So Chardonnay is, is deeply ingrained in, in my love of making Cap Classique and Champagne. And uh, the absolute is 
uh, Chardonnay, but it's aged for seven years and then we release it without dosage, so without any without any addition, just uh, simply the same white to top it up. And at the moment, we feel seven years is a good age potential for it. This year's release might be delayed. We, we've degorged it, but we just feel a little bit more time on cork is, is what it needs. Um, but it's a small release. It normally sells within about 10 days of being offered. And um, it's, a, it's a wine that, that you can drink now. But I've often said in the past, one of my goals in life is to make wines that my, my son can serve to, to his friends, to his, his uh, um, you, you know, to your son or daughter uh, that's uh, drinking the Colmar wine. So we, we're looking to make wines that age as well. That's really important to us. I love that. I love sharing that sense of history and creating something with a legacy. In terms of that absolute, would that be something that you would think of perhaps as being the ideal Cup Classique for the upcoming engagement party of Derek Kilpin? Yeah, so Derek, um, he, he put us a little, under a little bit of pressure to make sure it's ready for release quite soon. So, And, uh, and, he, and he promised that the guilt gilt edged, uh, gold edged uh, envelopes are on their way to us. So yes, definitely looking forward to, to Derek's re reveal of, of the Absolutist uh, engagement. <laughs> Derek Gilpin, of course, is the managing director of Great Domain, who send a lot of wine around the country, and amongst that is the Colmant, and his engagement, or lack thereof, is a constant topic of uh, great amusement to all of his mates. Uh, just before I let you go, uh, Paul, I think when, uh, when things changed in terms of nomenclature and we could no longer call it champagne in South Africa as much as we did. Uh, and it was very much of what well, Cup Classique sort of the alternative. And it was always seen in a less light as such. Whereas now I get a real sense that Cup Classique has, it's in its own right. It's created its own space. Yes, it's a science style as champagne. It can frequently be compared uh, uh, with a, a particular French champagne, but it's, it's very much standing on its own feet now in South Africa. Yes, I think the, the groundwork laid by uh, Peter Ferreira and Johan Malan, Simon Sach and Jeff Valera and, and, and other producers really gave us the, the perfect springboard. And I think the new producers that are joining the association like this even better. But one of my favorite things to do is, is to serve champagne, French champagne, and Cap Classique. Um, at the table, and, and it's not really for me a comparison, it's a celebration of, of unique terroirs. We have something with the, the sun and the ripeness of fruit that they, they don't have, but they have this uh, really elegance and finesse from acidity that, that, that sometimes is difficult to, to hold in, in, in Cup Classic. So I think it's a celebration of, of each tradition, and yeah, I think it's a wonderful way to enjoy life. As do I, as do a number of our guests, uh, Bernard Herber, saying, wow, perfect engagement and wedding wine. Hope you're listening, Derek Kilpin. Uh, I think Bernard might have been one of our competition winners with uh, Anthony Rupert last week, if memory serves. And uh, Wim Brach saying, love Paul Herber's MCCs, as well you should, Paul. They are delightful. Uh, thank you very, very much indeed, Mr. Herber. It's been a delight spending time with you. I promise I'll be down to see you when I'm back down in France. But the interim will be drinking. Plenty of glasses here, and you do have one final request. This from uh, Greg Sherwood saying, feel free to send me a sample. I think that is of the Rosé New Wine Sounds Great, or he's referring to the Absolute. Uh, either way, get it your way, and he'll guarantee it's spread out all over the UK. Paul Herber and Coleman, thank you so much for being part of it. Cheers. Thanks so much, Dan. Keep well, huh? I will indeed. So there we go. That is uh, Paul Herber. Uh, thank you very much for joining us from Colmar down in Franchuk, which I hope is a little warmer than it was last week. We had a, a night at Holden Mutz where the world was really coming to an end. Thunder and lightning and roofs trying to blow off. Uh, very atmospheric, but you don't want to do that too often. So that is the Cap Classique of Franchuk, and it really is a wonderful home of the grape, of the style rather. Uh, terrific, terrific stuff being done by
with Paul. Uh, let's head up the road. Let's go to Stellenbosch and let's go to an estate that is in a time of transition and very happy transition as well. I think it's a great move for the brand, for the winemaker. Uh, David Finlayson, a very good afternoon. Hi, Dan. Good afternoon. Oh, there we go. Now, I know uh, I'm just giving you an advance warning is that uh, uh, David's Wi-Fi is uh, uh, a, little, uh, a little sketchy at the moment. I suspect his cousin Peter Allen is there busy downloading inappropriate videos, which is eating up all of David's bandwidth. And uh, I know David will agree with you. Hey, great to have you on the show and a very, very warm welcome at what is a, an incredibly exciting time. Uh, before we talk about the actual transition, the new brand and how all of that is going, uh, let's set out one of the more complicated family trees in the world of wine, uh, because every third bottle of wine in South Africa is somehow made by a Finlayson somewhere along the way. So we know there are Walters and there are Peters and there are Peter Allens and there are Carolins and there are assorted other Finlaysons who wander as lost tribes in the uh, more remote areas of the winelands. Uh, where does David plug into the family? Well, I mean, I always say the Finlaysons are like a, a rash. We're all over the place and you can't get rid of us um, in the South African wine industry. So, yeah, I mean, it all started with my grandfather, Morris, who was a Scottish pathologist and who came out to South Africa in the 19, late 1930s. And um, his, his big love on the side was food and wine. So he ended up eventually buying what's today known as Hartenburg. Um, and uh, in those days, they made the wines called Montan. Uh, my father, Walter, and Peter, were obviously the two famous winemakers from the next generation. And um, obviously, I'm third generation then, so I'm Walter's son. Um, Peter Allen is Peter's son, and Andrew's also sort of linked in there. And Carolyn, my sister, is uh, married to Jean-Claude Martin, and they're at Creation. Um, so I like to think of myself as the one that's quiet and under the radar, and sort of I operate um, very, you know, very quietly and sort of like a little hermit on the hill here in Stellenbosch. I'm not sure how much longer that approach is going to work for you because while you were just edge baston, that was fine. But now it's changed. Your name is on the label. So uh, in wine terms, you're straight into the uh, whirlwind of paparazzi. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a really cool move for you because it uh, it puts the wines in your own terms. Talk us through it, though, for, from your perspective, uh, the move from edge baston as it has been to David Finlick and Wines. What, what prompted the move now and, and why have you done it? Yeah, look, I mean, originally I spent 15 years uh, at Glen Carlo and my father's name and my name were both on the labels there as we were shareholders in the business. And uh, Edgebaston started as a sideline. It was very small, 3,000 bottles uh, of wine a year produced. And um, when I went on my own 11 years ago, I sort of didn't really think about pushing my own name as a brand. And, and and I just, it just grew from 3,000 bottles to 300,000 bottles of, of production today. But funny enough, you know, this has been a year of turmoil. And with things being thrown in the air, I'm, I'm a Gemini and I sort of, I, I struggle to concentrate on things. And um, sitting with all this time on my hands, I, I kind of realized now's the time to make a change. And perhaps focus on, on the family name. I mean, I think most of us in the family, all the different winemakers, we, yes, we, we're known in, in the industry, but we tend not to want to sort of shout our, our brand, our family name as a brand out there. And perhaps it's a, it's a mistake. Carolyn and, and Peter Allen and I have talked about doing um, co-wines, you know, where we all join together and that sort of thing. And maybe that'll happen in future. But uh, we re I reached a stage where I decided, you know what, Let's put my name on the bottle. Um, uh, I think the family name stands for a lot of heritage and a lot of history. And I think most of all, people know that we, whenever there's a Finlayson behind the wine, it's quality. Um, and we focus on quality wine production. That's that's our game. It's always been, I think, comes from the days of my grandfather and my father and my uncle. Everybody likes food and wine, and and we, we like to drink. Well, we would put it this way. We wouldn't um, sell anything we wouldn't drink ourselves. So it's got to be pretty good stuff that we put in a bottle. And therefore, my name is a guarantee of the quality that's in the bottle. That's that's the thinking now. Yeah. Well, you've got some strong endorsement on the decision. Greg Sherwood still with us in London. Best decision ever. Everyone loves David. Great new personal oh, brand. <laughs> if Mr. Sherwood is giving a thumbs up, you're doing something right. 
<laughs> Thanks, anyway. Greg. You're a nice guy too. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> there we go. Hey. You talk about only putting stuff in the bottles that you would drink yourself. The wine that you are putting in bottles, is it simply what you were making, you've changed the labels, or has there been a shift in, in what you're producing as well? A um, bit of both. I mean, it is it's it is still the same lines, the same wines such as a Sauvignon Blanc and a Chardonnay and a Pinot Noir and a, and a Cabernet. But there has been, I mean, put it this way, I've, I've been affected by many um, countries where I've made wine and many philosophies, different people I've met. Um, I spent time when I just qualified as a winemaker. It was 1994. I was very lucky. It was literally the end of apartheid and doors were thrown open and I was able to travel and start start working around the world. So I worked in 1994 in Peter Lehman Wines in the Barossa Valley. And I made enough money to pick up a backpack and go hitchhike around New Zealand. And I ended up sort of mucking in and, and helping at a couple of wineries in New Zealand for no pay, but just a, a bed and somewhere to stay for a couple of nights before moving on. Uh, and then 1995, I got a job at Chateau Margaux in, in Bordeaux. Um, and after that, I spent a lot of time in Napa, obviously with the link with the Hess collection, who, were, who became shareholders in Glen Carlo. So I had a lot of influences. Um, and I would say the American influence of going for ripe fruit very ripe wines, very big and bold style. It was kind of what tickled my fancy for, let's say, the last 15 years. And, and funnily enough, my dad said to me, uh, as he got older as a winemaker, he tended to go for slightly more restrained wines, higher acid wines, fresher wines. And of course, a lot of the journalists out there are into that, a lot of the wine fundies. I know Greg Sherwood likes fresh wines and that sort of thing. And I'm finding myself progressing to slightly lower alcohol wines, uh, slightly higher acidity, fresher fruit style, and moving away from really heavy oaking. And you'll see that yeah, under the new label, a lot of the wines are, they've been tweaked or put it this way, they've been restrained a bit more than what they were in the past. Another word of endorsement, this time from Peter Ferreira. Great move, David. Proud moment indeed. And uh, it's, uh, it's a moment with plenty of change. The, the labels look terrific. Uh, the wine there needs to deliver on it all. So let's have a crack at the first of the two we are going to try. Uh, and you've decided to send some Shannon Blanc my way first up uh, amongst the collection. You very generously uh, got brought up to my cellar. Uh, so, uh, so talk me through the Shannon, why this is one of the two you've picked for today. And that what in particular it says to you? Okay, well, the Chenin Blanc, I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a mixture of old vines. Um, I haven't gone the route of single vineyard old vine Chenin. Um, I, the first few vintages, when we started, I think 2013, uh, we were using the same vineyard that uh, Carpsox 1947 comes from. Um, and we, over the years, obviously they've needed to produce more, so we're not able to to get those vines or those so many of those grapes anymore. So we've looked around Kulinov and the Bottlere and found an, a couple of other older vineyards that were around in the planted in the 60s. And um, the whole idea with this was was kind of it was hatched sitting over a dinner table drinking too much wine with my American importer, and he he was really into, you know, he said to me, "You make really good." commercial lines, maybe you just, I can see you're an artist, try and do something a bit funky. So we, we went the whole hog here, just, we literally press this juice, leave it overnight, stick it in a, in a concrete egg and just let it do its own thing. Whether, if it turns out great, it turns out great. If it, if it bombs out, it, it would bomb out, but it, it hasn't. Um, and it's, so it's a natural wine, if you can call it absolutely natural, no yeast added, no acid added. Um, we sulfur it up literally in January of the following year, just before bottling. Um, and you'll see the label in the background. You can see it behind me as well. It's a sort of a, a beige label. So we have um, the black label series, which is uh, our sort of main uh, line of wines. And then the beige label will go under the Camino Africana um, name. And the Camino Africana means uh, the African way, or the African path. And these are, none of those wines are from my own vineyards. They're all um, special vineyards that I've sought out. Um, and in this case, it started off with the old vines on Karpsicht and we've moved on to Kulunov, the actual Kulunov farm, the original Kulunov farm, um, which is just around the corner from Edgbiston here. Um, and yeah, it's a wine that's done really well for me in, in a number of overseas markets. Um, it's quite an oxidative style because obviously there's no sulfur for 11 and a half months and um, just a 
yeah, it, it's it's a big mouthful of wine, and yet it's quite low alcohol wine. So um, it shows you can get flavor from old vines, that concentration, that richness. And and that's kind of the thinking behind it. it it's not a cheap drop, but it's also not by far not the most expensive Chenin Blanc out there. Mm, kind of a kind of reminds me of uh, of Derek Kilpin when he's out with his fiance. Uh, he's uh, just a little restrained, although there's plenty of a uh, charge behind it. And uh, oh, another great addition to that old vine Chenin Blanc story. Mm, delightful, and uh, I love the label. Uh, it's uh, really is it, is it a particular place? Is it, or is that just a piece of art that you've got on the label there? No, that's a piece of art, and it's done by um, my label designer who. It's kind of a Renelle Spice, and she is the daughter of George Spice, the late George Spice, who's the, the, the wine that we're going to talk about next, the GS. Um, but that's kind of her. I, I said to her, just I want something that sort of depicts the the Simonsburg and the Stellenbosch Mountains, uh, because for me that is. I was born in Stellenbosch, went to school in Stellenbosch. I spent. I had a little detour out in Paul at Glen Carla for fifteen years, but obviously I came back to my own property that I'd bought and, and built up here at Edgbaston in Stellenbosch. And yeah, I'm a Stellenbosch boy at heart. Um, so I wanted something depicting, but I also didn't want to sort of something that looked like a picture, an exact replica of the mountains. I just wanted to depict that idea of vineyards on the hillsides with the mountains in the background. And it, it worked, it's very basic, but it worked out very nicely. That I'm very happy with that label. And I think for me, what uh, what completes the circle on that label is that you can see that road drifting off into the corner, but you're not entirely sure where it's going. And I think that says your journey has still got somewhere to go, particularly on this new path. Uh, you mentioned the GS, so let's move straight on to that. And then it's important to uh, to dispel something here. Uh, now, this GS, uh, the letters GS have become incredibly famous here in South Africa. But if you go to the UK and you ask people about wine and GS, they'll say, oh, yes, I went to a wine shop in South Kensington, and a guy there told me they're all named after Greg Sherwood. They're not actually named after Greg Sherwood. That is Greg <laughs> dispelling a completely untruth, uh, untrue rumor. Uh, it is the Mr. Spice that you spoke about. And, and this is, it's a, it's almost uh, the stuff of myth, this, the GS 66, the 69. For those people who don't know what we're talking about, who George Spice is, what GS is, what 66 and 69 mean, and just sketch out that history and why it's such a cool part of the South African wine story. Yeah, I mean, it, it's all started back with, as a kid growing up, I would, you know, raid my, well, I wasn't raiding my dad's cellar yet till I was probably 15 or 16, but as a kid growing up, I always saw these purple labeled bottles with the GS stuck in, in, in uh, the linen closet that was his wine cellar at home on Blarklippen. Uh, and then one day, so when I got to legal drinking age, uh, we had our English agent out, who was his old friend, Julius Barrett, and, and um, we sat down and, we, and we, my dad pulled out a bottle of uh, Chateau Mogo. And then he said to Julius, I want to show you something. And he pulled out one of these bottles that had literally been sitting in the cupboard since I was, a, you know, since I could remember. And I, I'm happy to say that the GS just knocked the socks off the Chateau Margot. I mean, it was a 1978 Margot, not a brilliant vintage, but still it was Chateau Margot. And that just sort of stuck in my mind. Uh, and uh, then a couple of years later, I had the opportunity to, to take James Molesworth from the American Wine Spectator out. And he said to me he'd had a number of good old South African wines, including Niederberg, 74 Cabernets and things like that. But did I have anything perhaps to show him that would make him believe that South African wines can, can mature for a long time? So I took along a bottle of the 1966 GS um, and he proceeded to be blown away and give the wine 95 points, which at that stage was the highest score any South African wine had ever had and it was 41 years old. So going back to who made the GS wines, it was George Spice, the late George Spice that I mentioned. And George was um, the head of winemaking at Moni's and he was a director of um, Distel, in those days, Stellenbosch Farmers Winery. Uh, and this was an experimental wine that he made uh, in their experimental cellar. Um, apparently, for, it's very difficult to find out exactly what he did in those days, but the big story was that the wine didn't see any small oak. It was cold stabilized and filtered uh, at a very early stage. And it was pretty much almost undrinkable because it was so structured and so tannic when it was young. But that is the very reason the wine has lasted, you know, 50 odd years. Um, 
And he only made two vintages, or so the story goes, the 66 and the 68. And, and he didn't, they were never sold commercially. They were just given to friends and, you know, other winemakers, including my father and many of the older generation of winemakers around um, Stellenbosch and Paul have bottles of these stuck away in their cellars. Um, yeah, and, and now, you know, the wine has become quite famous. And what I discovered was that there was a 1961 made as well. That was his very first attempt. But uh, that, I mean, I've only ever seen one bottle of that. And if anybody's got that, that's worth a lot of money. But yeah, it's, it's probably the most expensive, one of the most expensive wines when it's sold on auction in South Africa. Roland Pins would tell you all about that, yeah. Now, Roland's already taken enough of my money off me with his wretched auctions this year. So I won't be phoning him. Although, if there is one wine I would like to drink, it would be that 66 GS. It's uh, if it really exists. I'm still not entirely convinced, even after all you've said to me there, uh, David. Uh, we can't drink it today, but we can drink something that is made in tribute to it. Uh, and, and that's what you've produced here, this uh, GS uh, by David Finlayson. How, uh, how intimidating is it for you as a winemaker, knowing that you are producing a wine that is paying tribute to something quite as iconic uh, culturally as well as wine-wise as the, the the original GS. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, when I started off with GS, it was literally, I mean, the original GS wasn't, hadn't been sort of brought back to the forefront of everybody's minds yet. Um, it was an article done in the wine magazine where we tasted some, I think it was Latour and Aubryon 1966s against the GS 66. Uh, and, and it was done when I was still back at Glen Carlo and the 66 years, you know, beat both of those wines in their tasting hands down. And then suddenly everybody started, sat up and sort of made a noise about it. So the big thing was that Renelle Spears, George's daughter, who's, who's my label designer, and I were sitting around having a meal and I said, I've got this one vineyard of cab that makes absolute tannic bombs. I mean, the wines are going to last 40, 50 years like your dad's wines did. Um, and I said, you know, why don't we just um, bring in production is pretty small every year, usually around three to 4,000 bottles. Uh, and why don't we bring the legend back to life to honor your dad? And she was like, that would be amazing. And, um, and yeah, so we, we, we did. And the, the first couple of vintages, we thought we would respect the old one by, by doing a different label and just keeping the GS on it. But eventually people were saying, you need to go back to that sort of weird, strange purple, pinkish color that the original labels were on. And we did, and, and the wine's a bomb. I mean, it, it sells in America extremely well. Um, it, it gets very high ratings, particularly in the American market. And I know Greg Sherwood has has wrapped me over the knuckles a couple of times because it's a very big cabinet. It's sort of usually over 15, 15 and a half percent alcohol. Um, and, and yeah, again, as I was saying earlier, I'm, I'm so sort of starting to get a bit more restrained in style and the next vintage after this will be the 2018 and that's down to 14 and a half alcohol we, we definitely maybe starting to respect a little bit more of the slightly greener flavors that you would typically associate with Stellenbosch. I see Greg has mentioned the cost of that original 66 33,000 rand a bottle is Mr. Sherwood. So just doing the calculations quickly. So that's about uh, that's about uh, 112 pounds 90. Uh, I think works out this morning or thereabouts. I'm not sure if Greg's got any, but if he does, uh, I'll have to go and visit him as uh, soon as travel allows. Uh, so let's have a crack at this then. 15% 2017. Uh, you said it's very tannic. So how approachable is it going to be now? Well, I mean, the big thing here is, you know, when, when, when tannins are ripe, they are more approachable, obviously, than when they, they're slightly green or herbaceous. And, and that is kind of uh, where my mindset has been probably for, I would say, the last eight to 10 years on, on this wine. Um, and and it, it does, it, it's a wine that some people, you know, either hate or love um, because it is so big. Um, but I do think 2017, just like 2015, are extremely, they're sort of vintages that are out there. They're, they're ridiculously good, and the wines are going to last even longer than what one would expect. So it is very structured, this 2017. It's, it's I mean, it's made to last 30, 40 years. Um, and ideally at this stage, if you want to drink this, you really need to decant it and then have it um, with a big steak at Marble or one of those places, you know. You guys in Joburg 
you, you can at least go there. <laughs> mm, oh, look, it's, it's already, it's certainly an, an absolute monster, but of the, the best possible sort and big and mm, crying out for that steak. So um, I think I might have to uh, have to place an order and put some of these on hold for a, a few years and see how they unfold. Uh, but even without the steak, it's a, it's a great tribute. I think Mr. Speast would be proud, uh, both for uh, recapturing his slightly hallucinogenic Art Deco label, uh, but also for paying tribute to him uh, with a really rich and big and, uh, and wonderful wine. Uh, Greg Sherwood trying to get back in your good books as he loved your CWG Red. Greg, stop pandering to the winemakers. Sit back there quietly in your corner. Uh, uh, so much else that you've got going on. Uh, the, the labels have changed. The name has changed. Uh, so what does the next 18, 24 months look for uh, look like for uh, for David Finlayson? Yeah, well, I mean, what's it going to look like for any of us out there? I, I have to say, though, that, that you know, COVID's been terrible and, and it, the world's a mess. But... You know, people seem to be drinking a lot of wine, and um, we sales are flying. So, despite our government's best attempts at, at slowing things down, um, so I think just focusing on on what we're good at and um, making sure that you know uh, we get that perfect balance that, that we're always seeking and probably will never eventually find that balance of ripeness uh, with fruit uh, and restraint all in one. So that's what I'm going to be just aiming at, focusing on it. Um, I spent a few years also with projects up in the Eastern Cape because uh, I was freaked out with the whole drought scenario in, in the Western Cape. And we planted, I planted a couple of vineyards up there, got a couple of guys running them for me. Uh, we shipped the grapes down to, to Edgbaston and we've made some wines here, very small volumes, a barrel or two a year, or Syrah and Grenache focused. Just to see that if um, climate change does really push us, we, we have other options in South Africa. And I think it's it's important that as winemakers, we don't stick our heads in the ground and think everything's going to be perfect forever. We need to be open to change and new possibilities. So, um, yeah, I mean, when, when certain products and lines are going well, then there's always the opportunity to look for something new and a new adventure and something new to do out there. And that's what I'll be trying to do for the next 24 months, I guess. I'm, uh, I'm trying to get my head around a wine of origin dispatch, uh, but I guess it uh, could work with me in time. But would that, would that be the first wine of origin, Eastern Cape? Um, there, has a, there have actually been people making wine sort of for home consumption and just selling to their friends for a couple of years there, but never it's never gone out into the sort of open market. Uh, it's difficult, and it's, it's sort of it's real frontier territory. It's tough growing grapes down there. We've seen birds are the biggest problem. You know, at the moment, grapes ripen up, um, they just come in in swarms because it's lovely, juicy fruit, and they just clean out the vineyard. We literally lost five tons of Syrah in two days um, last this last season. So, yeah, um, but there are possibilities. Uh, it's just who's going to be, I mean, Plet has already been quite adventurous for many people, and what's going on in the Midlands is also, I think it's, I think it's fantastic um, that people are, you know, putting time and effort into it. But it, making wine and planting vineyards is a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of effort. So, yeah, I've done it as an experiment. Not never sort of gone in commercially sized. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to burn my fingers too badly out there. <laughs> Uh, I think if there's anything that uh, links all of the Finlaysons together, it's a sense of adventure when it comes to wine, whether it's the exact wines you make or where you go to make them. And that adventure continuing now with you, David, with a, a change in brand, bringing your own name to it. I think it's long overdue because the uh, the accolades that you uh, you deserve will, uh, will now come in more directly. Keep making fabulous wine. I'm uh, uh, going to uh, hang on to some more of this cab and see where it goes. I think it's only up. And uh, good luck with uh, the new space, uh, not really a new venture, but, uh, but the new journey. And uh, look forward to seeing how it unfolds. And please give my warm regards to your dad. We've done many great events together with the Rotary Club of Parle. He's a wonderful man. And, uh, yeah, please uh, please do pass on my very best to him. Thanks, Dan. Do that. Cheers. There we go. David Finlayson. You'll know him as Edgebaston Wines, but now the wines of David Finlayson, paying tribute to George Spies and that classic GS, and uh, a label that's got the attention of another GS, Grant Sauls, regular supporter of the show. I like the GS label. I think I can work out why Grant Sauls. I think Greg Sherwood 
comes from the same point of departure. So it's wonderful Stellenbosch wines under a new label and some great bubbles out of Franschuk from Paul Herber with the Colmont range giving you your show today. Presented by Pick and Pay, who have that fabulous wine club that's absolutely free to charge, that get uh, free to join. It gets you a discount on 10 different wines every month. You get 20% off and you get three times a smart shopper points. So there are plenty of reasons to be part of that. There's also a really good online offering as well. So if you haven't joined yet, no charge at all. Make sure you do loads of great benefits and a terrific opportunity to support South African wine, which is what we love to do on Dan Really Likes Wine. We've been able to do that today as we hang out with a bubbles maker in France and a member of one of the great wine families of the world in Stellenbosch. And we've got plenty more wine coming up. So next week, Monday, I will be back at the house of David Higgs, uh, the enfant terrible of the cooking world online at the moment. Uh, he'll be out of Marble and Saint for the evening. And instead at home, he and I are doing a, a dinner for some guests later on in the evening. But he'll be joining me along with Jean Engelbrecht from Rustin Freda. Now, David Higgs and Jean Engelbrecht go back many, 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 many years. There's a Namibian connection. There's a restaurant connection. There's plenty of food connections. And they've done a load of travel including an amazing road trip through america and so i'll be chatting to both of them while drinking some of the wine including the brand new 2017 estate out of rust and freer it's a stanley classic we'll see what the newest iteration looks like and then also next week i will be going to one of the great winemaking regions of the world no not Stellenbosch, not the hemelanada valley not Elgin, not Swakland, not Robertson. I will be in Craigle Park in Johannesburg and find out exactly what I'm doing there and the wine I'll be drinking on our recorded episode next week. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching. Keep drinking and supporting South African wine. Big hug again to my good friend Pete Goffwood after the closing of his restaurant. But Pete, I know you'll be back and you'll be back soon, better and stronger than ever. Have a great evening. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Goodbye.